Good morning and welcome to Edmonds Adventist Church Sabbath School. Happy Sabbath, happy Easter. Today we're going to be studying the Seventh-day Adventist Adult Bible Guide quarterly. Our quarter this, uh, our lessons this quarter are on the Bible and how to read the Bible. Before we get into the lesson, a couple of housekeeping things. Last week I asked if people would rather continue with this format, just one person and on Facebook, or if you would like to have a Zoom group. The feedback I got was very much in favor of keeping it this way. They thought that it was too complicated to do Zoom and that we've had over 200 views and uh, probably we wouldn't get that many on Zoom. If you are interested in studying this kind of material, however, in a small group, we have some small groups starting. And they're going to be looking at the same topic that we're studying this quarter in the Sabbath School lessons. They're going to be using my book, Enjoying Your Bible. And if you would like to be part of one of those small groups that will meet on Zoom and enjoy a small group kind of Bible study, just contact Chuck and Patty Gacy. The email that you can contact them on is pattynd, that's P-A-T-T-Y-N-D, at msn.com. And if you would like to be part of one of those Zoom small groups, just give them a shout out and let them know you'd like to be part of it. And for Sabbath mornings, we'll continue on in this format. Let's begin with prayer. Lord, we're thankful that you have spoken to us. You've spoken to us ultimately through your Son. But you've also spoken, us, spoken to us through the printed page that points to your Son. And we pray today as we think about how you have given the Bible to us, that your spirit will guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the points that the lesson makes in this lesson on the origin and nature of the Bible, and by the way, that's a huge topic, isn't it? We could go on for a long time on the origin and nature of the Bible. But one of the points that it makes is that the origin of the Bible is divine. And the nature of the Bible is divine. It's a blending of human and divine, but it is divine. And therefore, the Bible cannot be studied with the ordinary methods that you would use to study any other book. The Bible can only be interpreted by faith. I want to explore that question. I'm going to ask you a question about it here at the beginning, and I want you to be thinking about it through the lesson. I'll come back to the question at the end and say something about it. Here's my question. I was studying New Testament in a university. It was not a Seventh-day Adventist university. My major professor was very much a churchman. He was uh, one who did a lot of speaking in churches, preaching and seminars. His wife was an associate pastor of the uh, church that was right there on the campus. But I had another professor in the New Testament department who told us that he was not a believer. He was not a person of faith. He had been. He had grown up in a church, but he said when he looked at all of the suffering in the world that had gone on for so long, he just could no longer believe. But he said, I know a lot about Paul, and I can teach you a lot. Now, what would you say to that? Our lesson says the Bible cannot be studied except by faith. And here is a teacher who says that he doesn't have that faith. Would it be possible for him to interpret the Bible, even though he didn't believe? 
Would it be possible to learn from such a person? Well, I'm going to come back to that at the end, okay? First, I would like for us to look at several verses in the New Testament that say something about Scripture. Most of these are in the lesson for today. In fact, I think perhaps all of them are. But I'd like for us to look at them. The first one is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 to 21. So get out your Bibles and follow along with me. We're going to be looking at several different Bibles. So pardon me, several different verses. And I'm going to turn my telephone off because I uh, forgot to take it out of my pocket. Fortunately, this is an informal Sabbath school class, not the sermon. Okay, you have your Bibles? 2 Peter 1, 19-21. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Well, I want you to notice that this passage says that God, through the prophets, it was not of human origin. And it says that you pay attention to it until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. We'll come back to that. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Here it says that God breathes a message into the scriptural writers, and it's useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting, and for training us in righteousness, so that we can be equipped for every good work. Another passage that was in our lesson, Romans chapter 15, verses 4 to 6. Paul says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now here Paul had been talking about some issues that divided the church, things people were fighting over, uh, what to eat and what days to eat it on. And he comes down to the end and he says, what you really need is to have the mind of Jesus. And then he says that these things in the past bring us to that, help us find that. They encourage us and give us hope. And that encouragement produces the mind of Christ. One more, one more. John 5, 39 to 40. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me and have life. So here, Jesus says, as recorded in John, that scripture is to point to him, and that through him we have life. Now, let's just summarize some of the things we found in these several verses. What are the goals of Scripture? 
Why do we come to scripture? So that the morning star can live in our hearts. So that we can be trained in righteousness. So that we can have hope and encouragement. So that we can have the same mind as Jesus Christ. So that we can come to Jesus and find life. So when we talk about the divine nature of Scripture, nature, the, the divine nature of Scripture involves pointing us to Jesus where we find life. It involves doing something in our hearts. It involves transformation. So one of the questions I think we have to explore is what's the relationship between reading and understanding and actually being transformed. Well, when we look at the origin of the Bible, as this lesson does, we find that there are a number of different ways that the Bible writers actually wrote. Let's just look at some examples. Exodus chapter 24, verses 3 and 4. When Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice, everything the Lord has said we will do. Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said. Now, I think we often think of Scripture as coming in this way. God says it, the person writes it down. But not all of Scripture seems to be that way. It's interesting that Jeremiah, the prophet, wrote a message to the king. And his scribe or servant, Barak, took it to the king. And you know what the king did? He took each page and it would cut it in half and throw it in the fire. He was not about to hear what Jeremiah had to say. So what happened after that? Well, in Jeremiah 36, 32, we read this. So Jeremiah took another scroll and gave it to the scribe Barak, the son of Neriah. And as Jeremiah dictated, Barak wrote on it all the words of the scroll that Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire. And many similar words were added to them. Now that's interesting. How were the similar words added? Barak add these words? Did Jeremiah add these words? It seems clear when we read Jeremiah that there's been some editing that's gone on because some of the book is by Jeremiah and some of the book is about Jeremiah. And it's interesting too that when we look at the Greek version of the book of Jeremiah, which is of course a translation of the original Hebrew version, the Greek and Hebrew are actually quite different. There's some different arrangement and some things that are in one and not in the other. So here we see a scribe who is a part of the process of Jeremiah writing these things down. Paul used scribes. There's one letter where the scribe actually gives his own little greeting at the end. It's in the book of Romans, chapter 16, 22. I, Tertius, who wrote down this letter, greet you in the Lord. So here the scribe, who actually wrote it down, greets the people at the end of the letter. Many of Paul's letters have the names of co-authors at the beginning. One question is, how much did those co-authors participate in the writing of these letters? And then, of course, there is Luke. Luke tells us that he did research to write his Gospel of Luke. He begins the letter, we saw this last week, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, 
most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So Luke doesn't say, I was there. He says, no, the eyewitnesses have written things down in the past. Obviously, there are, there's more than one thing that's been written down. We know for sure that one of the things Luke used was the Gospel of Mark because he follows it very carefully through much of his book and is often very close in wording. So he obviously had Mark as one of these sources. But he says there were other sources as well. And he through the guidance of God's Spirit, does his research and uses the sources and writes the Gospel of Luke. There's an interesting example that gives us a, a tiny hint into the process of the origin and nature of the Bible, the divine origin and nature of the Bible, and yet the human element as well, in 1 Corinthians. And first, I want to read something that Ellen White says about this book, about Paul's letter to Corinth in her book, Acts of the Apostles, which tells the story of the early church, follows along with Acts and Paul's letters. Listen to what she says, then I want to read a little bit from Corinth, uh, from, from the letter to Corinth, and uh, see what you think. Ellen White in Acts of the Apostles, pages 302 to 303. Paul was an inspired apostle. The truths he taught to others he had received by revelation. Yet the Lord did not directly reveal to him at all times just the condition of his people. In this instance, that is the writing of 1 Corinthians, those who were interested in the prosperity of the church at Corinth and who had seen evils creeping in, had presented the matter before the apostle, and from divine revelations which he had formerly received, he was prepared to judge the character of these developments. Notwithstanding the fact that the Lord did not give him a new revelation for that special time, those who were really seeking for light accepted his message as expressing the mind of Christ. The Lord had shown him the difficulties and dangers which would arise in the churches, and as these evils developed, the apostle recognized their significance. He had been set for the defense of the church. He was to watch for souls as one who must render account to God, and it was not consistent and right for him to take notice of the reports concerning the anarchy, but, but pardon me, was it not consistent? and right for him to take notice of the reports concerning the anarchy and divisions among them. Most assuredly, and the reproof he sent them was as certainly written under the inspiration of the Spirit of God as were any of his other epistles. So she says God didn't send some vision here for Paul to write 1 Corinthians, but people came to him and told him what was going on there, and he knew from his experience with God, that this was not right, and so he wrote. Now, if you look at the beginning of 1 Corinthians, I think you get a little bit of insight into the way Paul goes about writing. Sometimes we think that Scripture simply means that it was dictated by God to the person. But I don't think God would have dictated 1 Corinthians quite this way. We see that the mind of Paul is involved in the process. So in chapter 1, Paul is addressing the fact that they were divided into factions. Some people were saying, well, we're from Paul, and others were saying, well, we're from Apollos. And some said, well, we're from Peter. And so Paul is trying to speak to these divisions among them. And listen to what he says in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank, I thank God that I did not baptize any of you. Oh, except Crispus and Gaius. So no one can say you were baptized in my name. Oh yes, I did baptize the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. 
For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now, it's hard to think of God dictating that, isn't it? We see Paul's mind at work. He's talking to a scribe. We don't know who that scribe was here in Corinth, like we did in Romans. Romans, Tertius, who, by the way, would have been a slave, because Tertius simply means third, and that's how slaves were named, first, second, third, fourth. So we don't know who this scribe was, but Paul is apparently dictating to a scribe, and he says, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you. Oh, yes, I did baptize Crispus and Gaius, but I didn't baptize anyone else. Oh, yes, I did baptize the household of Stephan Steph uh, Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anybody else. The point is that you weren't baptized into my name, but into the name of Christ. Do you get an idea of how his mind is working there? Shows us something of the human side of Scripture, doesn't it? And I think that fits well with a position that I have found very helpful. A position on the origin and nature of the Bible and how it is inspired that was held by Ellen White. She talks about this. She talks about how there is a blending of the human and the divine that humans are led by God to convey a trustworthy message, but it is through the human mind and filter. Let me read you a couple of paragraphs from the first volume of Selected Messages, page 21. Here's what Ellen White says about the divine and human origin and nature of the Bible. The Bible is written by inspired men, but it is not God's mode of thought and expression. It is that of humanity. God as a writer is not represented. Men will often say such an expression is not like God. But God has not put himself in words, in logic, in rhetoric, on trial in the Bible. Now, that's an amazing statement, isn't it? God isn't on trial in word and logic and rhetoric in Scripture. The writers of the Bible were God's penmen, not his pen. Look at the different writers. You know, there are times when I read Paul and I take comfort in the fact that God didn't put himself on trial in the logic of Scripture. Because sometimes I just have to admit, I understand the point Paul is making, but I'm really not quite sure about his logic. But Ellen White says, God isn't on trial in language, in logic, in rhetoric in the Bible. The Bible writers are God's pen men, not his she goes on, it is not the words of the Bible that are inspired, but the men that were inspired. Inspiration acts not on a man's words or his expression, but on the man himself, who under the influence of the Holy Ghost is imbued with thoughts. By the way, she talks about the men who were inspired. I have a sneaking suspicion there might have been parts of the Bible that were written by women as well. She goes on, but the words and thoughts receive the impress of the individual mind. Notice that the words and thoughts receive the impress of the individual mind. The divine mind is diffused. The divine mind and will is combined with the human mind and will. And thus the utterances of the man are the word of God. Do you see what she's saying about this blending of human and divine? That God inspires not the words, but the person. And then the person takes the message of God and puts it in their own words and logic and rhetoric and conveys that message. And the message, because God guides it, is trustworthy. Now, I want to come back to our original question. What about my professor? The one who said, I don't believe, but I can teach you a lot about Paul. 
Can he really? The lesson says that we can't really interpret scripture unless we do it by faith. And here's a teacher of New Testament who says at least that he doesn't have that faith. Can he teach something about Paul? Did he know a lot about Paul, like he said? Absolutely, he did. Could he help us understand Paul? Well, my answer, taking his classes, was yes. Is there some different method that you don't use when you study ordinary things that you would have to use to understand Paul's letters? Well, in terms of just understanding, I don't think so. We still read words. We still look at what those words might mean. We go back and try to understand what they meant in Paul's day. We still look at the rhetoric. We still look at the sentence structure. We still look at the paragraph. We still look at the context. We do all the things that we would ordinarily do if we were reading anything. This teacher was an expert in Greco-Roman language and rhetoric. He was a linguist. He could do a lot in telling us why Paul said things the way he did and how other Greco-Roman writers and then how rabbis would want to put the rhetoric together to get a point across and what he was trying to say and the way he put it together. It was very instructive. I learned a lot. By the way, he was a very compassionate man. I do think that his reading of the New Testament had affected him more than he thought, even though he claimed not to have faith. I do remember one day when he became very wistful in class. He said, you know, I don't believe anymore, and I just can't be a hypocrite, so I can't go to church. But he said, there are some days when I just long to be in the congregation and see him. I really miss seeing him. And he said, I just don't feel that I can do it since I don't believe. I remember once I was going through a bit of a problem. I, I was sent there by one institution and there was another institution that was calling me to go there. And I was struggling with that decision and he heard about it and called me in and very compassionately explored with me what the options were and the advantages and disadvantages of both sides. It was very pastoral actually. So, can I learn from this person who doesn't have faith? Well, I think the answer is yes. However, it's a yes, but. He can help me understand. He was an expert. He knew the languages. He knew the rhetoric. He can help me understand. But Paul did not write simply so that people could understand, nor did the other Bible writers. Remember what we saw at the beginning? What is the purpose of Scripture? It's to lead us to have the morning star in our hearts. It's to train us in righteousness. It is to give us the mind of Jesus Christ in the way we deal with other people. That doesn't happen just by understanding. That only happens when we come in faith and let the Spirit lead us. So, is it possible to read the Bible as you would another book? Well, yes, of course. I mean, we read all books by understanding the language. But the Bible has a deeper purpose. And that purpose is only met in the Spirit.
Now, sometimes we think that the Holy Spirit is there simply to tell us what the text means. I don't have to study the text. I don't have to do the work of exploring the languages and trying to understand the way I would any other text. No, the Holy Spirit just tells me what it means. I don't think that's true. I think that we have to study diligently. And we have to use the various methods that we use when we study any piece of literature. And yet, we also come always to inviting the Holy Spirit to lead us. The Holy Spirit doesn't simply tell us what it means. But I think the Holy Spirit does do three different things that are very important. And I don't have time to explore these today, but on another lesson this quarter, I will take time just to go through this and explore these. Three things that the Spirit does for us when we study. It doesn't just tell us what the text means. But number one, we come and ask for the Spirit to put away our prejudices. You see, we all come to the Bible with our own filter, the filter of our own personality, our own culture, our own background. One of the things we need to do is ask the Spirit to open our minds and free us from those prejudices that we might bring to the text. It's interesting that after the resurrection, Luke tells us that Jesus opened the disciples' minds so that they could understand the scripture. The Holy Spirit helps us open our mind and free us from the kinds of prejudices that we might bring to the text as we try to understand it. Second, the Holy Spirit is the only agent that can transform us. We need to transform our hearts, and only the Spirit can do that. The Spirit uses Scripture to speak to us at the deepest level of our mind and our soul. That's the only way we can take on the mind of Christ and become like Him. So the work of the Spirit is vital. We don't come to Scripture as we do just another text because we come to the scripture to be transformed and we rely on the spirit for that. Third thing the spirit does is give us the courage to act on what we find in scripture. I remember a statement by Peter Marshall. He said we spend way too much time worrying about how to interpret the difficult passages of Scripture. He said, our real problem is actually doing the parts of Scripture that is so plain you can't miss them, like love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. So the Spirit gives us the courage to take that message of Scripture and put it in our hearts. As I say, in a subsequent lesson, we'll look at those three things in more detail. But more about that on another day. For now, we'll stop and give you a break between now and church. Our worship service will start at 11 o'clock, about 25 minutes, with a children's story and a sermon and also some news about our church family to keep us together. So thank you for tuning in and we'll see you again in about 25 minutes.